I love when the wind blows on the sea. There is something meditative about observing activities outside of human influence. Shorelines being created, rocks being worn down, a young sea in a constant state of change. I want to tell the story of the smallest elements in the grand scheme of things, to showcase all the creatures that make their home in the Baltic Sea, whose very existence testifies to nature's power and indomitable will to survive, despite human interference. Over 90 million people live in the countries surrounding the Baltic. Yet, even with the sea so close at hand, there is much we don't know about it. The Baltic isn't like other seas, with hundreds of fish species and a wealth of colorful corals and organisms. but the entire fabric of species in the Baltic Sea is unique and important, well worth preserving and fighting for. There are so many exciting things to discover, if only we knew where to look. And we have looked. For several years now, my team and I have dived, paddled, shivered and crept in the water and mud, trying to capture on film as many as possible of the fascinating creatures that live here like viviparous eel pouts, gobies, shimmering silvery schools of lesser sand eel, vicious-looking short-horned sculpins, and several other charismatic inhabitants of the murky waters of the Baltic. Our first encounter, a glimpse of an eye reveals a European flounder on the Baltic floor. Like other flatfish, they look just like any other fish when they first hatch. But after two weeks, one of their eyes migrates over to the other side of the head. That's why flatfish prefer to lie on the seabed, both eyes on top of their heads. When threatened, the European flounder, he and the company of an opossum shrimp, can bury itself in the sand, cleverly camouflaging itself from predators. The eye of the sea observes me as we lie there just inches away from each other. Much easier to spot is the blue mussel, a common sight in the Baltic. Blue mussels make up about 80% of the sea's invertebrates in terms of sheer weight. They're responsible for filtering much of the water in the sea thanks to the unique way they eat. You could say that they eat by breathing. One little mussel can filter several liters of water an hour. And as an entire population, it's estimated that they filter the entire volume of the Baltic Sea at least once a year. Blue mussels are true ecosystem engineers. Here's a blue mussel that got itself into trouble. These amphipods, called Gamarus locusta, work together to break open the shell to get the soft interior of the mussel. The hungry creatures seem willing to sample just about anything. They eat small animals and plants, but they will also gnaw on fish trapped in nets. Sometimes when you're swimming in the sea and feel a little nibble, it might actually be a Gamarus locusta tasting you to see if you're edible.
The isopod, Saduria entomon, a distant cousin of the woodlouse, is a remnant of the last ice age. The species is believed to have spread from the coast of Siberia all the way west to the Baltic Sea. It is one of the biggest invertebrate predators in the Baltic, measuring about nine centimeters long. It lives in muddy and sandy lake beds from very shallow areas to a few hundred meters deep. Most of the time it burrows into the mud so that only its antennae stick up above the seabed. As autumn fades into winter, something about the cycle of life reminds me of my own mortality. There is something gripping about the transition between the seasons and nature's inexorable progression. When the first snowflakes fall, it's almost as if nature breathes a sigh of relief. Winter ice can vary significantly from year to year in the Baltic. Even in deepest winter, less than half of the surface is covered with ice. It can be difficult to perceive and understand the gradual changes in our climate, but research shows that the Baltic today appears to be warming faster than any other sea in the world. Fish and other sea creatures are heavily impacted by the changing ice quantities, temperature, and salinity, as well as changes in the availability of food and the presence of predators. Many birds have gone south, but some species, such as the white-throated dipper, remain in the Baltic countries throughout the winter. The white-throated dipper, also called the European dipper, thrives best near streams and rivers, where it can dive into the water and even run along the floor of the stream, hunting for caddisfly larvae and other tasty tidbits. About half of the biomass of our seas consists of microorganisms, which play a crucial role for the rest of the marine life. But until now, we've understood very little about them. At the bottom of the food chain are plankton, the smallest creatures in the sea, apart from bacteria. Plankton are free-floating organisms that make up the foundation of the marine food chain for smaller and larger animals alike. Phytoplankton are plant-based and need sunlight to survive, so they are found just below the water's surface. The giant swaths of plankton at the surface are sometimes called meadows of the sea. Plankton are often too small to be seen with the naked eye. But microscopes let us capture these completely surrealistic cavalcades of microorganisms. When I see this region's biggest bird of prey, 
the white-tailed eagle. It reminds me of how fragile everything really is. Humanity faces enormous challenges and it's easy to lose hope. But the truth is that every individual can make a difference. The white-tailed eagle in front of my hiding place is an excellent example of a species that has been severely impacted by human activity, but that has also been helped by our efforts. Studies of white-tailed eagles have shown that this was the first Baltic species that clearly signaled the effects of environmental toxins. During the 1960s and 70s, the number of white-tailed eagles fell dramatically. And by the early 1970s, this species was perilously close to extinction. Thanks to the hard work of a few devotees, vital research and bans on several chemicals, the white-tailed eagle has recovered surprisingly well. But the battle is not over yet. Recently, scientists once again discovered high concentrations of environmental toxins in the eggs of white-tailed eagles found along the coast of the Gulf of Bothnia. These days, we know that environmental toxins harm living organisms in many serious ways. With their ability to spread widely and their slow decomposition, the toxins persist in the environment for a long time. Far out in the outskirts of the archipelago, gray seals give birth to the young in February and March. Here I am photographing the cubs, which are born with a thick woolly coat that they later shed. For the first few weeks, the cubs live on energy-rich milk and gain 30 to 40 kilos of weight. The mother, on the other hand, who doesn't have time to eat during this period, loses 60 to 70 kilos. When she's through nursing her cub, she swims away. And after about a month of fasting, the cub has to learn to find its own food. Since the mid-1970s, researchers have kept track of the population of the three Baltic seal species, gray seal, harbor seal, and ringed seal. Their situation has gradually improved. From having been critically endangered in the 1970s, the gray seal in particular is now a common sight in our archipelagos. All my castles of air have melted like snow. All my dreams have run out like water. Of all that I loved, I have only left a blue sky and a few pale stars. The wind moves softly among the trees. The emptiness rests. The water is silent. Another exciting spectacle we can watch every year is the annual migration of roach. Many fish migrate, some daily, some yearly, from a few meters to thousands of kilometers.
The primary reason is reproduction. Roach spawn on warm days between April and June, when the water is at least 10 degrees. It's a two to three day process. When the female is ready, she swims into dense vegetation in the male's territory. The male or males trigger the release of eggs by pressing against the female belly to belly and swimming together with her towards the surface. The females can spawn from 5,000 up to 200,000 eggs. All freshwater tributaries around the Baltic, from babbling brooks to giant rivers connecting lakes, watercourses and wetlands affect the sea and are a part of its unique biology and stability. You could describe the tributaries as modes of transport for a plethora of creatures and nutrients. Pike are found throughout the Baltic Sea, in all lakes and watercourses that are not heavily acidified or lacking oxygen. Drifting towards a pike under the water surface is a bit like encountering a shark lazily patrolling a coral reef. It's an awe-inspiring ruler of its system. Many shallow, vegetation-rich environments have been dredged or taken over by swimming jetties and marinas. It's important to spare as many natural environments as possible for fish like pike, because these are their favorite places for breeding and spawning. But changes to the landscape are not the only potential problem. Careless fishing also disrupts pike breeding. A female that gets caught on a hook before she can lay her eggs can be tied out to such a degree that she may not survive long enough to spawn them, even if she's thrown back in the water. Today, many wetlands are being restored to create pike factories, so the future looks bright for Baltic pike. Here we have a pike accompanied by a good-sized perch, also a migratory fish, although perch travel shorter distances. Perch are easiest to recognize by the stripes on their backs, their spiny dorsal fins and their red-orange pectoral fins. The threatened eels of the Baltic hold the record for long-distance migration. They follow the Gulf Stream towards the Azores on their 7,000-kilometer journey to their breeding grounds in the Sargasso Sea, east of North America. Salmon, one of our most well-known migratory fishes, go through many ordeals in their lives. Their young hatch in the freshwater environment of rivers where they stay for a few years. The young salmon, called smolt, 
return silver to manage a life at sea and then migrate to the Baltic. Most salmon migrate to the southern Baltic where they grow quickly. After a few years, they migrate back and when they smell the fresh water from their home river, they swim back to the place where they were born. They face many difficulties on the upstream journey, passing through mighty rapids and other obstacles. And these days, not all the difficulties on the journey are created by Mother Nature. All migratory fish are affected by the destruction of natural water environments by mankind. In spring, large numbers of birds come back to the Baltic Sea. The great crested grebe, which is our largest and most common grebe, returns from Western and Southwestern Europe and the Mediterranean. When they find their mates, the grebes seek out reedy areas to build their nests. The nest is usually a raft of reeds and aquatic plants anchored to a single reed but the nest can also lie directly on the seabed. Great crested grebes have separate toes rather than webbed feet, and they rotate their feet like propellers when they swim. In fact, propellers were actually based on the great crested grebe's feet and swimming technique. One of many examples of biomimetics, or how we humans try to imitate nature when we develop new technologies and innovations. Like all grebes, the great crested grebe is a good swimmer and a fast diver. When threatened, it escapes diving rather than taking flight. The horned grebe, with its red eyes, tuft of plumage, and rust-colored throat, is somewhat smaller and less common than the great crested grebe. It thrives in small lakes, but can also make its home in sheltered bays with rich vegetation. Bays with no predatory fish are a necessity for the horned grebe to dare to breed. The nest itself is a little raft attached to reeds or other plants a meter or so out in the water to prevent attacks from land-based predators. Happily, recent years have seen an increase in the number of horned grebes in the Baltic region. I've always been enchanted by watching toads' mating activity under the surface. They can travel a few kilometers to their breeding grounds over the course of several arduous nights. Almost any water will do as a breeding ground. In this bay, we see lots of meaty long strings of jelly filled with thousands of toads' eggs, crossing right over a giant clump of frogs' eggs. Another warty acquaintance is the critically endangered European green toad, which prefers to live near the sea. In daytime, 
the toad stays out of sight in hollows, coming out mainly in evening, or as shown here, early morning. The toads here are preparing to breed. Mating involves eager males climbing all over the females. The common Ida lays her eggs in a simple nest. Well camouflaged with her brown and beige feathers, she sits motionless and near invisible. Early in spring, the Ida couple seeks out an island in the archipelago for a suitable nesting site. They build their nest somewhere protected from the wind, between tufts of grass or in the shelter of a rock. The warm insulating down on the female comes loose just as she gets ready to sit on her eggs. She plucks the down and arranges it in a ring around the nest and eggs. Later, when the eggs hatch, the inquisitive little Ida chicks swim around eagerly. Quite a trick for mum to keep track of so it's no surprise that females often band together to raise their chicks together. The males look completely different from the females, with stunning white plumage with splashes of pistachio green and black. Male eiders can be very hard on each other. It appears they'll stop at nothing to impress the females. Along the many beaches and shore grasslands around the Baltic Sea, all sorts of wading birds gather, such as dunlins, ruddy turnstones, pied avocets, and Eurasian curlews. Each of them is a specialist in finding food along the shoreline. This pied avocet, with its characteristic upturned beak, is perhaps looking for crustaceans, algae, or fish row. The Eurasian curlew is the world's largest wading bird, with a wingspan of a full meter.
The male three-spined stickleback with its blue eyes is an exotic splash of color in the yellow and green shoreline vegetation. If I lie completely still with my camera, I can get close. Close enough to watch the mating ritual. During the breeding period, the male builds a nest of plant parts on the seabed or in the underwater vegetation. He swims back and forth, gluing together the gaps between the plants. And then he lures his intended mate to the nest. Once the female is interested and squeezes into the nest to spawn her eggs, the male slips in through the entrance to fertilize them. Then he stands guard and looks after them until they hatch. Of all my childhood memories, perhaps the strongest is lying safe and blissful on my tummy in the warmth of the sun, looking down through the weathered planks of the jetty at the perch or sticklebacks to the sound of lapping waves. That's one of the absolute privileges of childhood, at least mine. Everything is blooming, full of life. The scents of the sea the woods and the meadows after the night's rain, the swan pair in the bay, the sounds of the terns, swallows and bees. The Caspian Tern the world's biggest tern has a wingspan of 130 to 140 centimeters. They don't like to nest on their own, preferring colonies. This tern has strict requirements for the kind of environment it thrives in. It wants flat islands of stone and sand in the sea, preferably located in the outer rim of an archipelago or off the coast. Caspian terns are extremely sensitive to human activity and may abandon their nesting place if disturbed. But if they're left alone to settle in, they often return to the same nest year after year for the rest of their lives. Caspian terns look after the young for a long time. Sometimes they keep feeding them until they reach their winter home in West Africa. When invaders come near a Caspian tern's nest, like this timid young black-headed gull, the tern mounts a frenzied attack. Crabs are rare in the Baltic Sea. Because of the low salinity of the water, few crab species can thrive here. 
but we can find green shore crabs in the southern parts of the sea. Shore crabs are genuine opportunists, eating most anything they can get hold of. Dead animals they find on the seabed are particular delicacies. When it's time to mate and the shore crabs have found their partners, the male carries the female around to make sure he is right at hand when the time comes. They can't begin to mate until the female's shell turns soft and flexible. Fertilization does not occur immediately. The sperm can swim around in the female's body for up to 45 days. Once the sperm find their destination though, they fertilize some 180,000 eggs. It takes about nine months until the eggs hatch and the crab larvae drift away with the current. One of the greatest problems in the Baltic Sea is eutrophication. Far too many nutrients are expelled into the water, leading to an excess of phytoplankton. The proportion of organic material in the water increases, triggering several physical, chemical and biological processes that affect every living thing in the sea. Dead zones occur when the algae and other organisms sink to the bottom and their decomposition uses up all available oxygen. The dead zones here and there in the Baltic amounts to 30% of the total seabed. One might compare the sea to a gigantic bathtub where everything you put into the bath stays for a long time. The slow water replacement, the warmer climate, environmental toxin and excessive fishing are additional factors contributing to the destabilization of the Baltic. The fact is, despite being surrounded by some of the world's richest countries, the Baltic is one of the planet's most polluted seas. In addition to eutrophication due to runoff from sewers, forestry and agriculture, and the fact that we live in a chemical society, another thing that affects the balance in the Baltic is the lack of predatory fish. Cod, a mighty predator, has a very important job in the Baltic ecosystem. Unfortunately, this once common fish is now often stunted and unusually small in many places and has completely disappeared from others. That's because of overzealous cod fishing over a long time, using the wrong methods, combined with the oxygenation problem in dead zones at the bottom of the sea. It's all connected. Over 10,000 years have passed since the inland ice sheet retreated from what we now call the Baltic Sea. Since then, stony cliffs and shorelines have been shaped by waves and winter ices. Traces of the Ice Age are clearly visible in many places, not least on the island of Gotland, where the sea stack stands as monuments to the might of the Ice Age glacier and the force of the erosion. Here, the tops of the sea stacks are covered by protective lichen, while thousands of years of water, wind and frost have caused heavy erosions on the sides. That's what's given the stacks these peculiar shapes, narrow at the base and wider at the top. The stacks are still gradually rising up out of the sea because the land is still rebounding from the weight of the ice that covered it during the last ice age.
Six kilometers off the coast of Gotland is the island of Stora Karlsö. Just like the sea stacks, it's a remnant of an ancient coral reef which gradually transformed into limestone. Thousands of common gilmets and razor bills nest on the steep cliffs. These birds live in a gray zone between being adapted for life in water and a life in the air. They fly with rapid wing beats through the air, but are perhaps even better at diving, during which they use their wings to steer and fly through the water. Common gilmots have been observed at depths of 180 meters, easily winning the Baltic Prize for diving. Both common guillemots and razorbills are reminiscent of penguins with their upright posture, black and white tuxedos, and some similar habits, such as the way they gracefully fly through the water when hunting. But they're actually not related to penguins at all. Some researchers believe that they developed this way through what's called convergent evolution. This means that their shared traits are not caused by a common ancestor, but because of a similar way of life. Here on Karlsö, we can observe one of the most magnificent spectacles of the Baltic for a few weeks each summer. When the gilmet chicks are preparing to leave the safety of the nest high above the sea. At about three weeks of age, the chicks leave the nest with one of their parents. Still not capable of flight, they jump off the cliff and fall dramatically down into the water or sometimes onto the rocky shore. Thanks to the flexible physiology of the young birds, most of them survive the fall and rejoin their parents waiting in the water nearby. From this point on, the male gilmet takes care of the chick until it's big enough to survive on its own. Nowadays, we know that the abundance of cod determines how many European sprats are available the common gilmet's favorite food. Sprats, in turn, regulate the presence of zooplankton, which lives on phytoplankton or algae. If there isn't enough zooplankton to keep the algae in check, this can lead to giant algal blooms. It's obvious how these pieces of the puzzle are connected. It's also clear that these changes in the Baltic ecosystem are due to human activity, not natural variation. Perhaps now we can finally agree that everything is connected. That we are part of nature and nature is part of us. No matter whether a landscape is in Sweden, Finland, 
or here in Poland, there are elements that are undeniably associated with our impact on nature and our dependence on it. The landscape around the Baltic Sea varies widely, from rocky shores to meadowlands, to sandy beaches, to lagoons, to the enormous sand dunes in Slowinski National Park here in Poland. Here, real life seems more like fiction. These giant sand dunes up to 40 meters high travel at a rate of 10 meters per year. In autumn, when the winds blow, the skies are clear and the water is cold, underwater visibility is at its very best, and it's easy to spot tiny, well-camouflaged creatures. The pipefish waving gently alongside the underwater vegetation is the Baltic Sea equivalent of the seahorse. In the region, we have at least six different species of pipefish, which live in coastal eelgrass meadows and seaweed belts. Just like seahorses, pipefish use their narrow, hose-like mouths, like vacuum cleaners, to suck up tiny crustaceans. The blades of eelgrass sway as if in a gentle summer breeze. A unique living environment and nursery for a wide array of marine animals and plants. The moon jellyfish that comes gliding across the eelgrass is the most common jellyfish in the Baltic. This transparent disc-shaped creature has four pink, blue or pale yellow rings in the middle of its body that are in fact its genitals. Moon jellyfish can live at great depths or very close to the surface where they swim with lovely rhythmic contractions, which create a jet stream that propels the jellyfish forward. The mouth is on the underside, surrounded by several tentacles, but they can use their whole body to collect food, which consists of fish larvae, planktonic algae, and copods. If the prey needs to be killed or stunned, they use the venomous nematocysts in their tentacles. These tentacles are short and hang along the edges of the jellyfish's saucer-shaped body, but the toxin is too weak to cause humans much discomfort. There are many types of shrimps in the Baltic Sea. If you lie completely still, pretending to be nothing but a log or a rock, you may see giant swarms of opossum shrimps appearing right before your eyes. Another shrimp I've encountered is the Baltic prawn, which can be found from a couple of hundred meters depth up to just a few inches of water splashing among the algae and seaweed.
these shrimps filter food directly from the water. Bladderwrack is a key species of seaweed in the Baltic, creating the most species-rich environment on shallow, rocky seabeds. The dense fronds serve as home and nursery and larder for many insects and fish. Just like the eelgrass meadows, bladder rack is essential to the health of the entire Baltic. Unfortunately, eutrophication has made it difficult for this species to reproduce. In some places, seaweed belts have been completely eradicated due to emissions of chlorine from paper and pulp industries. The toxins used in boat paints prevent fertilization and any fertilized eggs that come into contact with the toxins become deformed. One of many ways to contribute to a healthier sea is to avoid harmful products. I know where the spiders spread their nets in the reeds waving over the water, where the darkest dawn trembles. I felt the darkest of darkness, living and loving and languishing under the woven blanket of grass, creeping and crawling and clambering, and catching and killing and eating, and breeding and dying to live, born again in a different future. A year has gone by. The natural world around the Baltic Sea continues its ever-changing life, despite the best efforts and flaws of mankind. It seems nature always gets by in some form, the question is only what kind of world we humans want, now and in the future. The pressures we put on the natural world today are huge. At the same time, for the first time in history, most humans are connected. We have greater responsibility than ever before to share our knowledge and our stories, to better understand and care for Mother Nature, who is so strong and yet so defenseless all at the same time. The Baltic Sea is unique in all the world, with its brackish water and its beautiful archipelagos. It's time that we start seeing our sea as a valuable, life-giving resource. The smallest elements in the grand scheme of things, whose very existence testifies to nature's power and indomitable will to survive, despite human interference. Everything we do has an impact. It's all connected.